backgrounds are often the hardest part of watercolor paintings. Sometimes they are the real star of the show and can take a lot of time and precision to render. Although not always necessary, it's often easier to paint a good background if you first mask off the foreground elements. I almost always start a painting with the background. It's a good discipline for many reasons. Since backgrounds are often the largest portion of a painting, getting it done first help you establish the overall palette and color relationships. In the end, everything works together better. Having a well-developed background also gives everything a sense of place and depth. There are two main options for masking off watercolors. Masking can be done with tape or liquid friskin. Tape can be really handy for straight edge objects like buildings. I seldom use tape because in the past I found it wanted to pull up the fibers of the paper or left residue so the paper didn't take washes and glazes evenly. Here's an example. When masking off this painting to put in the bright red lighthouse background, I used tape for the straight lines of the railing and liquid frisket for the curves. The two areas never took the wash the same. Tape is also harder to settle into the bumps on cold press and rough papers and may leave gaps. On hot press paper, it's pretty cooperative. One disadvantage to masking or scotch tape for non-hard edged objects is that you'll need to cut the tape in order to get sharp edges. This can be done with a steady hand and an X-Acto or a swivel knife, but if you're a fraction of an inch too deep, you can score the delicate watercolor paper and the edge will show when you wash in paint. Some people swear by tape as an alternative to frisket, but it typically isn't my favorite solution. Most often, if I'm doing complex watercolor with a render background, I'll frisket off the foreground elements in order to preserve the white of the page. Then I can work on the background without worrying about overpainting the edges of my foreground elements. Now, applying frisket isn't hard, but it is a bit fussy, and I'd be willing to guarantee that it is nobody's favorite part of painting. With a few tips, hopefully it will go by a little easier and faster. I've only used liquid friskets made of latex rubber. If you have allergies to latex, be aware of that. As far as brands, I've found that despite a fairly wide price range, most latex friskids don't actually vary much, so I tend to buy the cheaper ones. I typically use natural colored friskids, but some brands come in colors like nuclear green, light blue, or reddish. That added color doesn't affect the paper, but it definitely makes it easier to see if you missed a spot, which can happen. An advantage of the natural whitish color is that you aren't influenced by the frisket color when you're painting your background. I tend not to buy the largest bottles possible because I've had them start to dry up and go bad. A mid-sized jar seems to be the sweet spot for price versus waste. If you aren't painting much, you may open the jar and find it partially solidified. Unfortunately, there is no restoring that. Just throw it away and think of it as motivation to paint more so it doesn't go bad again. If you're new to liquid friskets, a word of caution, don't be surprised when you first open them and find it kind of stinks of ammonia. It hasn't gone bad, that's just the way it is. After a while, you stop noticing that slight smell. Frisket is a weird consistency, especially as it dries, it can be pretty messy. The best way to apply it is an area of debate. Over the years, I've used many things to apply frisket. Most of the commercial options were a disappointment. Note that frisket will gum up and kill your paint brushes. Think twice of using your old brushes. They won't hold up to this kind of abuse. If you want to throw away a brush, then go for it. Using a paintbrush is a one-use operation in my experience. Having done a ton of pen and ink work in the past, I've also tried crow quill pen nibs for tiny lines and again didn't find that very useful because of the frisket's changing viscosity and fast drying properties. The latex doesn't want to flow through the nib well. It only gets worse as the frisket starts dehydrating with time. I tried the Incredible Nib. Those run around 10 bucks. It's sort of like a two-sided empty magic marker. 
that tool never produced even moderately tight lines and has sat in a drawer unused for a good 10 years. Now, some people seem to like those. Let us know what your experience was in the comments. In the end, applying frisket came down to three simple tools that are easy to clean. For really wide areas, you can't beat a finger dipped in frisket. It's free. You have to love that. You almost always have one handy, and ideally you'll find it's already perfectly clean. Of course, it isn't terribly good for detail, but I'll often hit the big areas with a finger full of frisket and later come in with a finer tool to clean up the edges. For mid-sized areas, I like to use the painted handle of an old watercolor brush. That offers good control and doesn't gum up. You can roll off anything that starts drying up, and it is as good as new. For applying frisket in small detail areas, I've tried a variety of things and even made a bunch of homemade tools. In the end, I found something that's virtually free, works perfectly, and gets super fine lines, and it's easy to clean. I took out a new round toothpick and put that in a 2mm pencil lead holder. Amazingly, the round toothpick fits perfectly in there. That combination allows for very precise control, and you can easily roll off frisket that starts to dry up. You can also pull out the toothpick and still use it as a pencil lead holder. So now that you know what to use, what's the best way to apply it? Always apply frisket to paper that is bone dry. You may even want to hit it with a hair dryer before you start if the humidity is really high. Stir. Don't shake your bottle to mix it up. You'll put a million bubbles in the jar and there will be tiny dots where the frisket doesn't mask off your background. Instead, gently stir the frisket to avoid introducing bubbles. An old paintbrush handle works great. I usually work more or less across the page, so I don't get my hands in any frisket that's remotely wet. You'll be able to tell the wet from the dry frisket because it starts out milky and opaque and turns clear when it's dry. This works even with the colored friskets, which will dry tinted but clear. Don't start painting until it is fully dry. If my application tool starts drying up, I use a finger to roll up the drying frisket from the tools. Before long, you'll end up with a small glob of dried frisket. You can set that aside and use it later to remove the frisket. Remove any drying skin from the bottle. If I have a complex foreground, applying the frisket can take an hour or two, and sometimes the top of the frisket jar starts to dry and form a skin. If this starts to happen, I'll scoop out the stringy mess with my stirring tool and set it aside to dry. One thing to watch for is that as the frisket starts to dry, it gets super tacky and it likes to grab the new frisket that you're putting down. This can lead to splotches and drops. If you wait until a section is completely dry and clear, it makes it super easy to continue a line or a shape. When everything looks completely dry, I do a thorough check for holes, gaps, and bubbles in the frisket, as well as looking for little drops of frisket that may have fallen on the page. It's really easy to remove those now, but a pain if you don't notice it and end up with a white dot in a perfectly washed even sky that was covered by an errant droplet of frisket. I always put in a second thin layer of frisket on large areas that I cover with my finger because occasionally there's a gap or a bubble that I didn't notice. For some reason, frisket that goes down with a finger is more prone to bubble. Maybe it's because it goes down thinner than with the other tools? Once the frisket is inspected and completely dry, you can paint over the foreground knowing your areas are masked off and will stay nice and white. I try not to leave the frisket on the page for more than a day. If at all possible, I take it off after a few hours. Occasionally with time, the frisket takes hold of the paper too much and wants to pull up the areas you've covered. And if left on too long, it may discolor the paper slightly. When your background painting is done and the paper is completely dry, you can remove the frisket easily using a frisket pickup. They make commercial ones like the Frisk Masking Fluid Remover. I've literally never bought one. Remember that small glob of frisket you had from cleaning off the dried frisket from your tools? It's an ugly blob, but it's free, and you can use that to grab an edge of your frisket and start peeling it off the page. It works perfectly. 
As those blobs of mold first get dry up, they harden and darken and don't work as well. Throw it away and start a new one. Avoid scrubbing back and forth. This is likely to transfer paint to your clean areas. I always remove the frisket from a clean area and peel it back away from the paper. I'll roll up the used frisket into a ball and put it in the trash. Working toward an area that you just uncovered can unintentionally move pigment from your background wash over what used to be clean paper. You definitely don't want to do that. Congrats! Now you're ready to paint the foreground. Really, that's all there is to it. Thanks for watching. Give Liquid Frisket a try and see what you think.